Coming to you from the Windy City. Welcome to Let's Talk Shop, a podcast about all things cloud and enterprise tech. Listen to insights and guest interviews with IT thought leaders and professionals. Now, here's your host, Elias Kanaser. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Let's Talk Shop. Today, I've got one of the biggest cloud providers on deck. I've got AWS, and specifically, I've got Matt Lewis from AWS. Matt, you are a senior solutions principal. Uh, I messed it up. Well, what's your title? <laughs> the, the titles seem to be getting longer and longer as time goes on. I, I'm a senior principal solution architect on the EC2 team over here at AWS. I had it inverted. Thank you. Welcome to the show. And um, everyone, this is going to be an interesting conversation. Matt, why don't we get started with what is it that you do at AWS exactly? Yeah. So as a solution architect, uh, my original title or, or function at, at AWS was to help customers build the right things on AWS. So using all of an, and I used to be a network engineer. I spent a long time in the network service provider realm. Uh, I was a managing uh, one of the larger internet backbone, backbones in uh, Asia Pacific. So we had some huge uh, 40 gigabit per second connections into this this country at the time. It was it was a lot of, a lot of bandwidth. We'll talk about what that looks like now. Um, but um, so I know networking really well. And uh, in AWS, I basically work across all of the networking services that we have for our customers. Uh, what I've done in recent times is I've moved more into the service team where I'm helping EC2 or in specifically uh, specifically EC2 networking build things like transit gateway, uh, do optimizations on our internet gateways, v the VPC service itself. Uh, we're looking at some different ways to do routing inside of VPC and connect to on-premises or other realms that folks want to connect to. So I'm working across all of the, um, there's basically five pillars of networking services. We can, we can dive into that though, but that's basically what I do for AWS. Well, I like that you went directly to networking. So let's get started. So one of the biggest digs that I've always told AWS, and to be honest, not just AWS, the other cloud providers are are guilty of this as well, is just the number of services. And this is, again, not just specific to networking, but since you're the networking person, let's talk about networking. So there's a lot of networking services. I mean, uh, when I was at Gartner, I used to follow the space and it was hard even for me to to kind of keep track. And, and there were services within networking that kind of overlapped. I could do the same thing with different services. So you've been doing this for a long time for AWS. How do you mentally organize these services, especially if you're in front of a customer and you want them to sort of follow the flow? You mentioned five earlier. How do you do it? Yeah, so I, I think about it in uh, five different pillars. Uh, one would be foundational services, things like Amazon VPC, things like Transit Gateway. These are the foundations or the underpinning mechanisms that you're going to use to, to build first and then build applications on top of. Uh, then I think about connectivity to the VPC. And so getting access to the VPC from maybe other VPCs, from maybe other regions, from maybe on-premises or, or uh, other um, places you might have workloads and their services like Direct Connect, VPN. Um, we've got some other services that kind of cross those two foundation and global connectivity pillars like CloudWAN, for example. CloudWAN is a global service with a, it's a network segment that you can connect to VPCs, but connect to on-premises as well. Uh, then we have our edge services, things like CloudFront. Um, and we also uh, have been working recently in the edge space, we've got things like our private 5G, which we can chat about if you're interested, yep. outpost local zones, we're extending regions out closer towards the edge. But the traditional edge services are really CloudFront, Global Accelerator, and Route 53. Uh, then uh, application networking, which is the fourth pillar. Application networking was interesting when I first joined AWS back in uh, 2012, where load balancing or elastic load balancing, as we called it at the time, was basically now it's a classic load balancer. Uh, was what enabled auto scaling or elasticity and that was where i mean this blew my mind where um, i talked to customers and they're like hey we're using this thing called auto scaling and we're deploying a thousand instances every time we see an event and i'm thinking in my head from data center days like a thousand servers every time you see something very different deployment like that 
it's wild, right? absolutely wild. Yeah. Um, we have been expanding um, application networking recently, though we now have Amazon VPC Lattice, uh, which we can chat about today. Basically, um, think about it like a service directory for your applications, but it also does connectivity and security as well to VPCs. And the last uh, would be security and, and remote access into the VPC with things like encryption, uh, our network firewall service. Part of the load balancing and security space is also our gateway load balancer service where you can actually deploy uh, partners or security firewalls uh, like your Sophos, Fortinet, uh, and others. Uh, there's a whole bunch of vendors out there that have appliances that run in AWS. So that's an interesting one that straddles both application networking and networking security. Um, but yeah, they're the five pillars. Uh, you can kind of compartmentalize into those five. Uh, I work across those. But what was interesting when I first joined AWS, we had about 25 services. And I was told, hey, Matt, welcome. Go learn every single service, like to the nth degree and learn every single thing about right. it. Uh, I think we've got now 200, 250 plus services. So I really just work in that realm of networking services now. And uh, uh, that's kind of my playground. So you mentioned a couple of things. Did you say VPC Linus? Did I hear that correctly? <laughs> well, okay. So so Amazon VPC Lattice. Lattice. Is a- I'm like, Lattice. is that something Lattice? Okay. Yeah. No, expand a little bit. Expand a little bit on that. Yeah. So there's been a whole bunch of uh, memes and discussion around the name. I've never heard it called VPC Linus. Every there you go. Only at VPC uh, Lettuce, with a, as in a lettuce leaf. Uh, uh, so if you think about uh, applications and connecting to applications, let's say you've got a couple of different VPCs and you're starting to segment and um, what folks tend to do is they will um, stamp out environments and VPC is a really nice perimeter of that environment, right? You've got an application, you give an app dev team a a VPC and say, go for it. That's your environment. We're going to have some networking controls around there. You can't configure an IGW or internet gateway. Uh, You can't configure uh, routing or something like that, but you can build your application and and use application load balancer, for example. Then you've got consumers of those services, which may have, uh, maybe it's another application sitting in another VPC. Now, what would traditionally happen, and it's funny to use the term traditionally because I'm talking 2018, 2019 transit gateway. It's already old. Traditionally. (laughs) It's already old. Uh, Great service. We'll, We'll talk about transit gateway more, I'm sure. But what customers would do is connect those VPCs together and connect the routing together. And so now you've got uh, a few different uh, personas. You've got the application folks who are managing the application. You've got the security folks who are like, hey, I need to lock things down. Maybe I want firewalls. Maybe I want some kind of uh, IAM controls, uh, identity access management. Uh, And then you've got the application owners that are saying, hey, like um, we're building this stuff in VPCs. And the networking folks are configuring and building all of the routing and, and transit gateways, et cetera. What you do with VPC Lattice is you essentially have the application owners register their service with a service directory. You build a uh, network which is able to connect to the VPCs without using VPC peering, internet gateways, or anything else. It's actually VPC Lattice that does the connectivity itself. And those services are now available in the VPCs of the consumer. And you've got a whole bunch of security controls that you can do uh, in the VPC Lattice service itself. And so what happens is the the service essentially looks like a DNS name, C name inside the consumer VPC, but it's routed to a special uh, set of IPs, a 169.254 range of IPs, which are endpoints for the lattice service. And so if you think about Transit Gateway, where we've got a fleet of instances that are supporting packet processing and that sort of thing, VPC Lattice is doing that for you just in a more application-friendly way, as opposed to a networking-focused routing configuration of network way. You know, so you've got two different kind of layers that you are able to configure there and, and use. Um, customers use both Transit Gateway and VPC Lattice now, um, but you know we'll see what happens in the future. So that, that was one of the the things that I was mentioning earlier. I mean, it sounds super interesting. I think it simplifies things. It's an abstraction layer of sort that it has a bunch of automation underneath it. But there's also Transit Gateway. But for folks that are familiar with AWS, maybe not as familiar, can you make a differentiation or a distinction between Lattice now, between Transit Gateway and CloudWAN? What is very quickly the different use cases? Because I want to ask you a bunch of more things before we move on from this large topic. But amongst these three, when do I use which? I would say if you've got a lot of applications 
and you're a smaller team that's a little less network centric. So you don't have, you know, a couple of dedicated folks that know networking in and out. Um, you know, think of the old CCIEs that have, are now working in cloud. Um, I'd say VPC Lattice is, is a great solution for you. Uh, I would say if you do know networking and you're familiar with routing or you have some on-premises connectivity and you've got Direct Connect maybe, which is, we can talk about Direct Connect rate service, been around for a long time, but think physical fibers into, into AWS from your on-premises connectivity. Transit Gateway is a great solution. But Cloudware kind of comes in when you start thinking about global deployments. And the truth is, Cloudware is sitting on top of or is abstracting away Transit Gateway. Transit Gateway technology is still in Cloudware, except instead of with Cloudware, you jump into each region and configure a Transit Gateway and you say, okay, I'm going to connect all my VPCs and then peer with a Transit Gateway in another region with Cloudware. And you say, hey, I'm going to configure Cloudware and you have this uh, edge. Um, a device that you connect to per region, but you've got this network segment, which is now global. And you don't need to jump into every region and manage your transit gateways individually. So if you're going global, absolutely start thinking about CloudWAN. You can connect on-premises to CloudWAN, just like with Transit Gateway. One last change, which I think is amazing and worth calling out, with CloudWAN, you've basically got, uh, think of it like networking as code. You can roll back configuration. You can manage your configuration as part of the CloudWAN service. So you do a deployment you, and you don't like it, you can roll that back. With, with trans, Transit Gateway, you're managing that via, say, Terraform or CloudFormation or configuring it through the console, right? You don't have that kind of orchestration help with, with that you do with CloudWAN. If I'm a new customer to AWS and I'm starting fresh, why wouldn't I just do CloudWAN? Well, uh, I think CloudWAN, like we've had this evolution of services. Transit Gateway was, I think, 2018. Uh, CloudWAN is pretty recently uh, G8. I think when was it last year or, or 2021? All the years merged together for me. But um, CloudWAN is much newer than Transit Gateway. And yes, you could absolutely just start with Cloud. Okay. Uh, that gives you Perfect. orchestration. If you want to go global, you can. Um, it is a great service. I don't see any reason why you wouldn't want to start with CloudWAN. Perfect. Now, you're, you're a solution architect, so you work a lot with customers. Um, is Amazon's advice still to segment applications per VPC? At one point, it was one Amazon account per application. Is that still the best practice, the recommendation? Because when I used to talk to a lot of customers, I used to try to avoid this level of segmentation, which is at the application level. I used to like to advise customers to have multiple VPCs, but not to the point of single VPCs per application. You talk to a lot of customers. What is the best advice there? Obviously, every use case is going to be different, but it, you know, if you could generalize it just a little bit. Okay. There's, there is a statement that um, I feel myself using as a solution architect and some of my other solution architects use. I'll say it depends. And the answer is, <laughs> it's de it depends. I, I, I watched one of your uh, previous sessions and that was that was one of the comments you'd made too. And I, I kind of chuckled because we, we use that a lot too. It does depend. Um, I, I think, so one of my side hobbies is to make stickers for laptops. Every reInvent, I, I bring out some new stickers. They're normally like wizard stickers. Maybe this year I'll make a sticker that says, it depends. I want one. I want one. <laughs> okay, you got it. You got it. Uh, okay, so the answer is it does depend, but uh, it depends on a few things. So we have uh, all range of different types of architectures, and we see it all the time. And so we've seen this evolution of... Originally, VPCs were designed to be a replacement for your data center. Think of a virtual data center, a virtual private cloud. It's your data center. Every customer gets one. That was great. Then they built 10 because they said, hey, I like this segmentation mechanism. Now, it may be 10 accounts. It may be one account, 10 accounts under one org uh, organization, or maybe it's just one account with 10 VPCs in it. So it depends on normally the um, business structure of the organization and then the different application teams and then maybe there's some billing stuff that comes into it but an account is a nice um, box around your environment but also a VPC is as well so what I tend to see is a few accounts maybe one maybe three maybe a couple but then multiple VPCs and as customers grow they say I'd like another VPC please maybe they're using service now to vend accounts or vend 
and give VPCs or whatever it may be, but then customers grow to 10, 100, 1,000, or we've seen customers that have upwards of almost 10,000 VPCs in their environment. And yeah, so I've, that, I'm, I've seen those customers. And before Transit Gateway, that was a networking nightmare, by the way. So, I mean, AWS well, organizations and Control Tile and all of that helped a lot. But, you know, earlier than that, you know, I'm talking 2016, 17, when customers were creating a lot of accounts and there was really no good mechanism to centrally manage them or manage them in bulk. That created a networking nightmare, especially for Direct Connect. Now there's a lot of constructs to help manage all of those, correct? There, there is, there is, it's gotten better. What happened with the evolution of VPCs is customers said, these two VPCs will talk to each other. Oh, there's peering. Great. I'll use peering. This application wants to talk to that. Oh, peering between that. Suddenly as they progress, they think, okay, we've got segmentation, but everyone wants to talk to everyone. And so now you're building a full mesh, which is the N to the N minus one over two. Uh, I think I got the math right on that. It, it's a full mesh problem where if, I think the numbers were for a hundred VPCs, you need 4,950 peering connections. So which is actually not possible. You can't have that many routes inside a VPC route table. And the peering limit is 125, which is actually a hard limit. So yeah, three gateway helps. helps with that. But um, the reason why it really does depend is we've seen another type of customer where they've started building lots of VPCs, but then they've said, hey, hold on, we've got a really strong networking team. We're using some things like Istio or overlay networking. Um, Hey, AWS, we think we can innovate faster than you as far as networking services go. Maybe that's the case. You know, there's some pretty smart people out there that think about this stuff all day long sure. and they say, I'm just going to use one VPC. And so now they've got one VPC for their whole environment. Now, the problem with that is we do have limits on the size of Max VPC. Was, yep. Right. And so um, what we hadn't, we weren't great at talking about this in pre in previous times where customers would think, hey, I can have up to 50 um, slash 16s associated with a VPC. I, I wouldn't do the math on that, but that's 65,000 times 50, but um, there's a lot of IPs. However, the real limit is in-use IPs, and that's every instance that has a primary IP, for example, or if it has multiple secondary IPs, we can have a maximum of 256,000 IPs in a single VPC, and we also across two VPCs that appeared, we have a maximum limit of 512,000 VPCs. And so what we started to see were customers were getting closer to that 256,000 in-use IPs. And then they would say, okay, well, let's stamp out these environments. And I'm going to say, here's 100,000 instances. Here's another 100,000. Here's another 100,000. And then they'd use Transit Gateway to connect those together. Um, or if they're using something like a something that needed a lot of bandwidth, like Kafka or something, they'd use peering directly between those and they say 100,000, 100,000, that's 200,000, or within the limit and transit gateway for everything else. So um, I kind of coined this term and it's kind of, it's really, um, really nerdy, but uh, a VPC area network, which is kind of what I'm calling that's it. That's another sticker. <laughs> Man, <laughs> that hasn't taken off. No one's, no one's using that, but... But basically, we are seeing these VPC area networks with things like a combination of all of the above, you know, transit gateway peering, and then maybe private link as well, you know, private link uh, interface endpoints. I love private link. Dropping okay. services in the like VPC. The, the great service, it really is. Let me ask you this. We've talked a lot in a short period of time, and again, this highlights, you know, the, the hundreds of services around networking. We're in a world right now that is gone crazy over Gen AI. Um, for me personally, I can't get around the fact with AWS and other cloud providers that at some point I would like to log in and I want to see the management console has just a chat GPT type text box where I can say, Hey, I'm trying to do this. Give me three different architectures using the ideal services that you think will work and show me what you got. And instead of me having to remember the names of services or which service to use or whatever, I just want to essentially give it my intent. Here's what I'm trying to accomplish. And I want it to tell me what to do. Do you think we're going to get to that world anytime soon on the AWS management console? And I know, I know you're not on the product side, but you interact with a lot of customers. Do you think about this? Do you feel like, hey, this could work with the it depends situation? Well, 
I have been playing around with bedrock and 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 Claude a little bit, and you know it's, it's your your standard kind of Chat GPT style thing. Um, when I think about networking, there's two different areas that it really affects. So we can talk about the networking of the data center and instant sizes, and that's actually there's some pretty crazy numbers there to specifically address the question of whether uh, I think there's going to be some kind of chatbot that's going to help me architect things. I would hope so. Uh, and I see it in maybe two different personas. Uh, one could be a persona that is more of an architect style persona. And we've been chasing this thing, not we as in yeah, yeah. AWS, but the industry for a long time to say, right. wouldn't it be great if I could automate all of my network topology and give me a diagram, right? Um, what's interesting though, the scale that Amazon runs for, for our data center networks is we don't really use diagrams anymore. They're just too huge and it's not, it's pointless. Um, but for my environment, as maybe a customer, it would be immensely useful. We do have network manager, which gets a little bit closer to that. There's like a, shows a flow of connectivity and, and shows what, what, what you're connected to, but having a chat bot that sits there and you say, Hey, um, tell me about my environment. Tell me what my architecture is. Oh, uh, hi, Matt. I see you're using a three-tiered web architecture, and um, this is kind of like a monolithic application, and maybe you should consider using serverless, and here's what how you could insert Lambda into that architecture, and, and uh, what do you think? And you say, oh, that looks great, and then it says, uh, would you like me to deploy that now? There you go. Right? Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> that would now, be awesome. Um, <laughs> now, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I can't talk about any roadmap stuff here. Uh, we do have reInvent coming up, um, oh, yeah. but like in that, what I've just described is uh, from an industry perspective and my personal view on, hey, wouldn't that be an awesome service? Um, the, the second persona I'd like to see personally uh, would be um, support, right? I mean, oh, yes. hey, stuff's broken. Tell me what's going on. Like my stuff's down right now. I had an outage once um, when I was working on, on this internet backbone that we were talking about before. We just deployed some new load balancers for our DNS and um, something was going on and it turned out um, we had uh, unconsciously configured direct server return and we wanted uh, each of the DNS, the name server was talking to the, the resolver directly and not via the load balancer. So the load balancer was seeing like half a connection or whatever it was. I can't remember the specifics. Um, anyway, it was one configuration. And I'm talking about a internet wide outage for a whole country was based on one configuration. Now, that took us three nights to troubleshoot. Could you imagine yeah. if we had like a Gen AI uh, helper there to say, hey, you, hey, what's going what's on up? here? Oh, <laughs> I see that you've got some direct server return here for your DNS. Like you need to configure this one line and everything will be fixed. You know, like that would have saved us a whole bunch of. A lot of hours, right? <laughs> so absolutely. On the subject of, uh, of Gen AI, um, and again, you talk to a lot of customers, you advise a lot of customers. Is the topic of networking requirements and what should we do from a network perspective to support these Gen AI workloads, is that coming up? And if it is, what kind of advice are you giving customers? And what kind of advice can you give our viewers and our listeners that are being mandated to start thinking or start working on the requirements for Gen AI workloads in particular? Yeah, I, I think the biggest effect that we see is training of large language models. And what we've actually seen is uh, we released our P4D instance family uh, a little while ago. I think it's been about a year or two now. And that was a cloud first 400 gigabits per second oh, per instance. Crazy. Right. I mean, that I was talking about country wide networking. It was 40 gig. And like we, over the course of like maybe three years, we went from 40 gig to 40 gig redundant as 80 gig and then it was 60 gig redundant so 120 gig for a whole country and it was it was funny at the time uh that you know the side side story uh, we were up upgrading our capacity because our links were getting congested up to 40 percent and we turned on netflow finally and we're like hey uh, about like 25 percent of this 40 percent is all going to this one site called like youtube like people are watching cat videos and we're literally upgrading undersea fibers to to, to support that, with, like that, to support that capacity, um, but what we see in, in in AWS now in in today's world is training of large language models obviously takes a lot of networking, and and I am definitely not a um, expert in training uh, large models or uh, inference or anything like that, but I do see the network effect, and so what I've seen us do is we've broken out 
our um, what we call our ultra cost topology, where we've said, okay, for these P4D instances, we're going to put those on what we call ultra cluster, which is a dedicated clone network. And um, this can span maybe a room, a building. Um, and then we said, okay, well, now we need more bandwidth because we've got the network to support it. I mean, TORS, for example, there's a great reInvent session by uh, Dave Brown, one of our SVPs last year at reInvent, where he talked about um, the capacity of our TORS uh, being 12.8 terabits per second, right, for, for a rack. Like, thinking about that capacity compared to the 40 gig internet capacity we used to be talking about, like 12.8 terabits per second is just such a huge amount. Um, so we've now got our TRN uh, instance, TRN1 instances that can do 800 gigabits per second. And we said, okay, well, for folks that need more networking, how about we have a network optimized instance, our TRN1N instances that can do 1600 gigabits per second. And then recently we released our P5 instances, which are 3200 gigabits per second. So you get 32 100 gig mix on a single EC2 instance. You know what would be awesome? And, and, and I I'm going to try to see if I can get this information. I would love to know, because I'm sure a lot of our viewers and listeners are, are shaking their heads like I am. I'm like, that, that's just crazy amount of, of bandwidth. I'd be super curious to know how many customers are actually using this and what size customers are. There? Is this still very niche? Like who would be using that? Because the more I think of this, you know, in corporate America in particular, which is kind of where I, I grew up and what I followed, I would be hard pressed to name one or two companies that could, that could take advantage of something like this. This has got to be niche. Am I wrong? Well, I think that a lot of the capacity comes from having to train large language models. And I don't think everyone needs to train a large language model. Right? I mean, I, I think my personal opinion is there'll probably be a couple of large players out there that are, that are training models. And, and then consumers of those models will say, hey, like I'm going to use this model or that model and this meets my need and it does a specific thing. And so I think there will be a couple of large players that are using this huge amount of bandwidth. But the, uh, the common person like myself who's like, hey, I'm, I might be using a uh, various large language model for some stuff I'm doing, or maybe I'm, I'm configuring my three-tiered web architecture of my, my serverless stuff, I'm probably not going to spin up a P5 instance to, to do that. It's just an overkill. I might spin up a P5 just to test to another P5 and see what happens when I test across two VPCs, um, you know, with, across peering. Um, you know, that'd be pretty awesome to see that amount of traffic. But generally speaking, I think it's going to be a few large players that are doing the training of large language models and need that kind of capacity. Very impressive. So anything else on Gen AI? And I know we're coming up against reInvent pretty soon here, but anything else on networking and Gen AI that maybe you haven't covered that we should talk about? Because I think this is a very current topic. It's an important topic. Anything front of mind that comes up with customers that you'd like to share? Well, it, it does come up a lot, and and um, I was just at a conference this this week, and it was um, I, I didn't think Gen AI was supposed to be the primary title of this conference, but that was find its way, right? <laughs> right. It was every single conversation we were talking about Gen AI, and and companies were were really trying to figure out how do I use this thing. I, I'm seeing some folks might be using it and seeing massive productivity gains. Um, but what about my data? I mean, what about data exfiltration for, uh, there was the case with Samsung where there were, I think some proprietary data ended up out there in the world. Um, you know, so the, there's, there's question marks around that. I think if we can get beyond that, um, it's probably going to be a really great tool. And I think from a networking lens, we're just getting started. I think we haven't really got uh, something that's really network focused from a Gen AI perspective. Uh, again, reInvent's coming up where we're, we're it's going to be an interesting time, so let's let's wait and see. Um, but that's probably about all I can say about that, right? That's now. fair. That's fair. Let me shift gears on you a little bit and uh, go to a, a different topic. So, again, you know, throughout my career, one of the things I, I focused on a lot was comparing the cloud providers, especially the top five or six. But let's let's focus on AWS, Azure, and Google. And one of the points of contention has always been with these cloud providers regions and availability zones and how they're architected. And, you know, some providers will say, hey, we do it significantly different, significantly better and very unique 
and all the others don't do it the same way. And then the others will say, well, we have regions and availability zones. Now, I know you're going to be biased. You, you work for AWS, but you're close to, to this architecture, to this global infrastructure. You've been using it and deploying it. So I'd like to go to you since you're outside of a little bit of the product organization. I'd like to go to you and, and ask. Why do you feel that the way that AWS architects regions and availability zones specifically is different than the way you know, Azure does it or the way that, that Google does it or even um, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure? Uh, give, me your, give me your thought here. Why is AWS different? Is it different? Yeah, um, I can't speak too much to, to our competitors. I'm just not familiar with their designs. But I, I mean, from what I've seen in, in my career and and you know, being a network engineer for large-scale networking, I used to manage uh, one of the largest layer two uh, spanning tree domains. Uh, I think it was either in, in the Southern Hemisphere or even the world. Uh, we had a massive amount of switching infrastructure and uh, we had uh, spanning tree issues all day long. And you know, the architecture was something that needed to be redone and we, we worked on that. That was basically one of my jobs for about two years. Um, and then I joined AWS and seeing the scale of the deployments that we do here, it just, it's absolutely uh, amazing to see what we've actually done there. Uh, now, so basically, um, when we think about our, our AZ topology, we've, we've got these things that we call transit centers. So dual transit centers, which are sets of data centers that are completely separate. And fiber coming in and out of our data centers specifically, we uh, use GPS coordinates to track all of that fiber. I have a uh, interesting story of way back in the in the day we had some redundant fibers coming out of a data center. This is not an AWS again. This is back when I was doing other stuff, uh, and those fibers went over the same bridge. Someone decided to light a fire under that bridge and took out all of our fiber pairs, and so the data center was down. And we're like, wait, what happened to redundant fibers? Now, what we do in AWS is every you know uh, distance along the fiber, we're GPS tracking that. So if that fiber does share, un go under a footbridge or whatever it may be, we're like, well, hold on. They come out of two different trenches at the data center, but way down way, 10 miles down the way or whatever it is, they're actually really close together. So that's going to be a fiber pair or grouping. And we'll use a tertiary path into the data center. So I think as we build our topology, we're thinking about things like uh, redundant paths into the data center, building data centers that are part of an availability zone. So availability zones do have multiple data centers, many data centers in some cases, and they're in different geographic locations away from another AZ. And an availability zone tends to be around 100,000 servers-ish. And so I think the capacity that we have at these availability zones is immense. And then coming back to the transit centers, you've got this kind of front door to the availability zone where we've got a whole bunch of capacity and connectivity uh, and think of it like uh, i imagine it like a cloud topology but just at a huge scale not within the data center you're talking about buildings and availability zones instead of uh top of rack switches and, and right. racks etc right so i think the capacity is just immense and the architecture is all fully redundant and capacity managed um you know it's an uh it's a marvel of engineering to be honest um, so I, I think that's why we don't see uh, very often, you know, region level events. Um, you know, they're very rare occurrences. It's not something that we experience that often. So you mentioned something really fascinating. So you're saying that you will geo track essentially the fiber that's coming into these availability zones to make sure that at no point they kind of converge to create, let's call it a single point of failure of sorts. So the fibers are being tracked so that they they never are close enough to to one another to be affected by a natural disaster a someone physically tampering with it etc yeah um well actually there's it, it's it's a little deeper than that too i mean i think from a physical sense physical fiber redundancies everyone does that right um, I think the level that we do it is is obviously uh, something that we're we're always on top of that by by GPS tracking fibers and you know owning fibers where we can and managing that as opposed to using third party providers if if we can avoid that. Uh, what's interesting too is we also have automated systems that sit on top of everything ac across our network. And there is a story which I, I can't remember the full details, but there was a um, a fiber incident where so let's say a pretender backhoe, for example, knocked out one of our fibers, and I think the measurement from our automated system was we lost like 13 packets or something like it was it was just 
such a low amount of packet loss, um, which, you know, in general terms, 13 packets is not going to be felt by a customer. No, that, that's a but in, in the order of things, right? Let me ask you a different question. So AWS is known for having physical separation of availability zones. Now, whenever I say that, a lot of providers will be like, well, we have the same thing, but it all comes down to, well, how much of a physical separation do you have between availability zones? You know, I've always said that AWS at least has a mile or two separation between availability zones. Do we have an accurate number that you're able to disclose about the physical separation of AZs? Yeah, AZs tend to be um, groupings of data centers and multiple AZs will tend to be within a 60 mile radius or 100 kilometer radius. And so we've got a, a reasonable amount of distance, but we know that that fiber running through 60 miles is the, the latency is gonna be quiet. But, but that's for synchronous replication. But how close can be can they be to, to one another? So I think we publish a minimum distance of how close they are, but they are generally around 60 miles uh, between like an AZ grouping might be here, six, within 60 miles, there'll be another grouping of AZs. And imagine you've got a geographical kind of hill over here. You might have a river. But can you have two AZs like that are less than a mile apart? Uh, no, I don't believe we have AZs that are that close to each other. And, and if we did, we'd probably put those data centers within the same AZ. Um, we do have, which I think is interesting, just stepping up a, a couple of layers to what the customer sees, we do have our infrastructure performance um, our tool that sits within Network Manager now where you can actually have a look at all of the AZs and say, I want to connect from this AZ to that AZ, and it will actually give you the uh, latency in milliseconds. And I think the most I've seen on there is about, um, I think it was like three or four milliseconds, and the lowest I saw was maybe you know 0.5 or one. We, we can jump in and check it out, or it's definitely worth having a look if you're interested in lower latency. Very cool. Now, um, what differentiates, again, the regions for AWS? Is it that all services within that region support availability zones? Is it the control plane is isolated per region and doesn't share uh, with other regions? Is a region completely fully isolated? So let, let me start with availability zones. Uh, we've done an immense amount of work into what we call availability zone isolation or AZI. And so the idea behind that is there's no service within an availability zone that is dependent on other services in another availability zone. That's the tenant of, of okay. that, that type of engineering. And um, so there was actually a, uh, an interesting tool uh, that was, this is, I'm going back a couple of years now, but I think our engineers called it ceiling cat, where basically um, imagine a cat looking down from the ceiling, but it's monitoring the networking between availability zones to say, hey, hold on, um, service X, like you've got a control plane dependency. So we've got checks and balances there to say, hey, if you're building a service, there's not going to be any dependency on availability zone. So that's within an availability zone perspective. Um, then when we talk the region, the region is um, obviously reliant on these availability zones. And so if you think about something like a VPC, a VPC is a region level service, but it's really a um, upper layer abstraction of a side range. It's a grouping, right? Think of it like a tag almost. Um, think of a packet going through a network. It has a VPC ID, right? Hey, you're in this VPC. What the actual physical thing that's involved or in, that is in the VPC is an EC2 instance, which is a server, right? So you've got two servers that are talking to each other. They might be in different availability zones, which means they need to be in different subnets because we don't have subnets that can share an availability zone because right. now we're building those dependencies, right? So isolated subnets, availability zones, instances inside those subnets, but they may be inside the VPC, which is a region level construct. Now, if we uh, think about something else like a transit gateway, which is a region level construct, it actually has fleets of um, its service in each availability zone. And so what will happen is you actually get an endpoint that 
is it for each availability zone. You say, hey, Transit Gateway, I'd like to use you. Okay, well, here's three endpoints for three AZs. And so you're talking to the local fleet in that availability zone. So again, a higher order service like Transit Gateway is compartmentalized into availability zone constructs as well. So if one AZ goes down, Transit Gateway is still functioning because you've got two other AZs. Um, You'll see that everywhere too. Um, What was interesting with our load balancing service, classic load balancing, Basically, what would happen is inside an availability zone, inside a sub say, hey, I'd like a, a load balancer, please. You would get an endpoint or an ENI inside the subnet. As you scaled with classic load balancing, you'd start to see more endpoints configured inside that subnet. And we'd always say, hey, you need to use or you need to have available enough IPs for elastic load balancing to scale because that fleet of elastic load balancing would be scaling with your infrastructure, with your traffic. With network load balancer, we're using a what we call hyperplane, which is actually what we use for Transit Gateway 2, and you get one endpoint, but it's still one endpoint per availability zone. So with a network load balancer, you configure it across three availability zones. It's actually a C name or a you know, DNS name, and you've got three A records, and each A record is a hyperplane endpoint or what we call a hyperplane ENI per availability zone. So again, we've got this compartmentalization in availability zone, even though it's seemingly a region level service. You and I can talk for hours. Uh, I mean, this would have taken me down DNS based versus IP based load balancing. And that would have opened up uh, a really interesting uh, a can of worms on the algorithm. And because I know that ABS kind of has a mixture of both, but primarily it's, it's DNS based, but I definitely want us to come back and talk about it. But I, I, I am hard pressed to ask this question that will be my last question unfortunately for 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 today but we live in a multi-cloud world i know aws doesn't love that term even though aws is making progress along multi-cloud if if i'm and i have to give them credit where credit is due but since you're on the networking side there's a lot of talk there's a lot going on in multi-cloud uh networking segmentation or networking software in particular what is aws's position um on that? Well, I we believe that um, customers will use one cloud as their primary cloud provider, but they may use other, other clouds as well. And so from a sec- solution architect lens, uh, what we're seeing is customers will say, hey, we've got this AWS deployment, but we may have bought a company or there's some acquisition that's happened and we've got another cloud provider as part of that mix and we want to connect them together. And so I think of multi-cloud from a technology perspective in two different uh, areas or two different pillars. One would be multi-cloud connectivity and the other would be multi-cloud orchestration. Now, I don't know too much about the multi-cloud orchestration piece. And that's basically the idea that you have a single pane of glass that can orchestrate multiple clouds. And I think that's a that's a tough problem to, to, yeah. to solve. And, you know, folks like Terraform, they support multiple clouds and a lot of customers use Terraform to do their orchestration for, to a certain degree. Um, but I think that's another another can of worms. From the connectivity piece, we've had some interesting conversations where customers will say, hey, I'm using the, uh, let's say the S3 equivalent over in one of the other cloud providers, but, and we've got a whole bunch of data there because we bought this company or we, that's just where we stored our stuff. And we've got an application over here in uh, Amazon in a VPC and it needs to access that stuff. How do we do it? And so I think from a multi-cloud connectivity perspective, we do support VPN connectivity between um, mul- multiple clouds. So you can connect us, we initiate VPN connectivity, you can build a VPN connection between clouds. From a direct connect perspective, I think the, some of the other cloud providers have started doing some physical networking magic around connecting between cloud providers. For us, it would be probably use a partner like an Equinix or um, we do have a very strong partner network and other partners like maybe an Aviatrix Aviatrix, might enable you to build, you know, connectivity across clouds as well. They have their, um, I forget what they call it. It's like a networking edge appliance that can build the orchestration and give you visibility. So we've got a pretty strong case there with partners. so it really does depend. We also have a um, case study that was just public published by Sonos uh, around they were connecting to other cloud providers, which might be worth uh, some of the audience checking out. And um, there's a bit of information there too. But from a I'll sure to standpoint, in the show notes that's uh, that's a good idea. So I'll I'll put that in the show notes as well. Yeah. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, from a connectivity standpoint, I, I think that we can make it simpler. But we, I mean, we're we're on. Think of it like a life cycle. Um, and I go back to the EC2 classic days where customers said, "Just give me some compute," and then they said, "Well, hold on, I want to do my side range, and I want to do this, and I want to have more security controls and routing controls." So we built VPC, and I want gateways that I can attach and detach, and we started building all of this stuff, and we go through this cycle of um, Lego blocks that customers want, and we do have Lego blocks for connectivity for multi-cloud right now if customers want to do that, and maybe we're at the next part of the cycle where it's hey it's time to simplify and customers want to have simple connectivity they want to be able to say here's one click for a security appliance or here's one click for for my multi-cloud connectivity so maybe that's something that we need to think about you know and we will go through those cycles and we have before you know we build components and we build solutions and we kind of figure out what customers want or where they want to drive us and we're, we're always coming from what the customer really is interested in and if they're interested in that we'll we'll go down that path that I know it's a delicate topic, so thank you for actually answering that question uh, in an honest way, in a, in a good way. So I really appreciate that. I've enjoyed this conversation very much. I think uh, maybe after reInvent sometime in 2024 when, you know, we've had a chance to digest some of the announcements and, and think a little bit about what's going to come out. Maybe we'll do a round two and I don't know, maybe there's there'll be an opportunity for some kind of a demo, hopefully, uh, after after reInvent. We'll, we'll bring some kind of a demo back to the show. But Thank you so much for spending this time uh, sharing your knowledge and kind of hearing what uh, what you're working with customers on. Thanks for having me on, Elias. This is, this is awesome, and I'd love to come back. That'd be amazing. Amazing. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.